it was a miracle that I was able to come back here. I would never thought I'd have never even dreamt that I'd be able to come back here. Have you ever wondered how many people died during World War II and where all the bodies ended up? I devoutly hope that we will never again have to uh, see such scenes as these. Join us as we look at what they never told you about what happened to the dead bodies on D-Day. Thousands of soldiers killed on D-Day. It was the greatest amphibious invasion in military history. On June 6, 1944, more than 150,000 brave young troops from the United States, the United Kingdom, and Canada stormed the beaches of Normandy, France, in a daring operation to drive the Nazis out of Western Europe and reverse the tide of the war for good. When preparing the D-Day invasion, Allied military officials were aware that deaths would be staggeringly high, but it was a price they were ready to pay to build an infantry presence in France. Days before the invasion, a key strategist warned General Dwight D. Eisenhower that paratrooper deaths could reach 75%. Regardless, he ordered the strike. On June 6, 1944, more than 156,000 American, British, and Canadian troops stormed 50 miles of highly held Normandy beaches in northern France, marking a watershed moment in World War II. From the start of the war, Allied leaders Franklin D. Roosevelt and Winston Churchill recognized the importance of launching a massive invasion of continental Europe to relieve pressure on the Soviet army fighting the Nazis in the east. Since Operation Overlord began in England, the United States military had to ship 7 million tons of supplies to the staging area, including 450,000 tons of ammunition. Prior to the invasion, ammunition was displayed at Morton and Marsh, England's town square. The D-Day invasion began in the early hours of June 6, with hundreds of paratroopers landing inland on Utah and sword beaches to shut off exits and destroy bridges, slowing Nazi reinforcements. On June 6, 1944, U.S. Army infantrymen approached Omaha Beach in Normandy, France. The first waves of American fighters were slaughtered by German machine gun fire as they scrambled over the mine-infested beach. At Omaha Beach, U.S. forces persevered through the day-long battle, pushing ahead to a strong seawall and then up steep bluffs to destroy Nazi artillery positions by dark. Anticipating an Allied assault somewhere along the French coast, German forces finished building the Atlantic Wall, a 2,400-mile chain of bunkers, landmines, and beach and ocean barriers. Massive landings at Omaha Beach occurred after U.S. troops captured it. D-Day was the most significant amphibious invasion in military history. Germany surrendered less than a year later, on May 7, 1945. In August 1944, American soldiers kneeled in reverence at their fallen colleagues' graves near saint mer Eglise. On June 6, 1944, Americans were responsible for 2,500, one of the 4,414 Allied deaths. On D-Day alone, the Allies suffered approximately 10,000 casualties. The D-Day beach landings were disorganized and brutal due to adverse weather and fierce German opposition. With the first waves of landing forces incurring heavy losses, particularly U.S. troops at Omaha Beach and Canadian divisions at Juneau Beach. But because of raw tenacity and grit, the Allies overcame those severe early losses and captured all five Normandy beaches by nightfall on June 6. The first Allied cemetery in Europe was established on June 8, 1944, just two days after the D-Day invasion. Since that day, military officials and memorial organizations have worked to compile a definitive list of Allied D-Day casualties to properly memorialize those who made the ultimate sacrifice for the free world. The National D-Day Memorial Foundation is one of these organizations. At its Bedford, Virginia memorial site, 4,414 names are etched on bronze plaques, representing every Allied soldier, sailor, airman, and Coast Guardsman killed on D-Day. Carol Tuckwiller, a librarian and genealogist for the Foundation, conducted years of laborious study to arrive at that total which remains the most exact tally of Allied casualties during the 24-hour period known as D-Day. According to John Long, Director of Education at the National D-Day Memorial Foundation, when the memorial was being designed in the late 1990s, there were widely varying estimates of Allied D-Day casualties ranging from 5,000 to 12,000. German casualties on D-Day are estimated to be between 4,000 and 9,000 dead, injured, or missing. The Allies also took 200,000 German prisoners of war. While military records plainly prove that hundreds of troops died during the early stages of the months-long Normandy campaign, it was unclear when many of them were killed. 
During the pandemonium of the beach landings, for example, some soldiers found themselves fighting and eventually dying in different companies. Commanders tried their utmost under difficult conditions to appropriately document the fallen, although death dates were not always clear in the fog of war. Their mission was to win a world war against Hitler, not to keep records that would satisfy peacetime researchers 75 years later. Tuckwiller began by inscribing the death date of June 6th on all grave monuments at the Normandy American Cemetery. Then she looked through what remained of World War II military records, many of which were destroyed in a fire in the 1970s, looking for after-action reports from the invasion that included confirmed D-Day deaths. Tuckwiller discovered that the U.S. military would formally declare a soldier dead if he had been missing for one year. Many of the men who went missing on D-Day, some were swept out to sea or killed in severe jet crashes, had a death date of June 7, 1945, a year and a day later. Of course, Tuckwiller could not automatically include all military members who perished on June 7, 1945, in her list of D-Day casualties. She needed to ensure that each slain soldier's division would have arrived in Normandy on June 6. For example, men were still fighting in Europe and the Pacific in 1945, thus their names had to be changed. Experts acknowledge that the Foundation's list is incomplete, but claim that it is the most accurate total available to date. On June 6, there were 4,414 Allied deaths, with 2,501 Americans and 1,913 Allies. If the total appears low, experts believe it is because we are accustomed to seeing estimates of the number of D-Day losses, which include deaths, injured, and missing. While casualty estimates are notoriously difficult to verify, not all wounded soldiers are tallied, for example. It is widely assumed that the Allies suffered 10,000 total losses on D-Day. The biggest casualties were on Omaha Beach, where 2,000 U.S. troops were killed, wounded, or went missing. On Sword and Gold Beaches, where 2,000 British troops were killed, wounded, or went missing. And on Juneau Beach, where 340 Canadian soldiers were killed, and another 574 were injured. The great bulk of the guys who died were killed in the initial waves of the attack. German artillery killed the first soldiers who stepped off the landing ship. After the pillboxes were destroyed and the machine guns were silenced, the subsequent waves of soldiers faced significantly better odds. Among the astonishing losses of those first wave soldiers were 19 young men, known as the Bedford Boys. Bedford, Virginia was chosen by the United States Congress as the site of the National D-Day Memorial because it had the most per capita D-Day losses of any community in the country. The 19 Bedford boys were largely National Guardsmen and were among the first to land on Omaha Beach. As a result, their losses were just staggeringly high. Two decades after the National D-Day Memorial Foundation began its search for the D-Day dead, another name has been added to the bronze plaques. On Memorial Day 2019, the Foundation announced the inclusion of John Onken, a German-born soldier who was most likely among the first to die for his adopted country during the seaborne phase of the D-Day invasion. At 4 a.m. on June 6, Onken and his fellow U.S. cavalry troopers were entrusted with clearing two tiny islands off the Normandy coast of potential Nazi gun sites or enemy lookouts. They didn't find any Germans, but they did run into minefields. Two men were killed, and one of them was John Onken. In addition to receiving his proper place on the National D-Day Memorial Wall, Onken's name appears in We Will Remember Them, a new book released by the National D-Day Memorial Foundation to commemorate the 75th anniversary of D-Day. Burial. Temporary graves were dug near the beach. Though D-Day preparations had been ongoing for years, nothing could have prepared everyone for the reality of the Allied conquest of continental Europe and its implications for troops. According to the National World War II Museum, the initial rumblings of what would become Operation Overlord, often known as D-Day, began in 1942, but did not materialize until the summer of 1944. The German High Command expected Allied soldiers to land elsewhere in France from nearby England, but officials chose a 50-mile stretch of the coast in Normandy. An estimated 160,000 soldiers were to land on five beaches, with airborne units landing farther into France. On June 6, 1944, German resistance was particularly harsh for American soldiers landing at the Omaha and Utah beaches. The terrain and weather complicated the strategy even more, throwing ships off course and forcing soldiers to walk through water while under fire. Nonetheless, the Allied forces triumphed and won the day. Following D-Day, a practical but extremely tough challenge remained. What to do with all the bodies? Allied forces left thousands of their friends' remains spread across the beaches where they perished. The bodies revealed the invasion's deadly toll. Furthermore, they had to be collected and buried in the most courteous manner 
feasible in a conflict zone. So, who took on this daunting undertaking, and how did they accomplish it? This is what happened to the bodies from D-Day. For as well organized as the D-Day assault may have been for officials such as Supreme Allied Commander General Dwight D. Eisenhower, the experience for soldiers entrusted with landing in Normandy was chaotic. According to history, terrible weather and fierce German opposition not only caused confusion, but also resulted in hundreds of casualties. Prior to the invasion, advisors warned Eisenhower that most of the 150,000 soldiers would perish in the effort. They expected an exceptionally bleak 75% fatality rate among paratroopers. While it is apparent that thousands of men from both the Allied and Axis forces were killed that day, determining an exact number of casualties has been challenging. As history points out, it was unreasonable to expect commanders to meticulously record when and where a military member died, especially if the individual ended up with a new unit during the confusion. Furthermore, missing soldiers were not certified deceased until a year following their disappearance, adding to the confusion. Most memorials today indicate there were around 4,414 Allied deaths, with the greatest casualties on Omaha Beach being approximately 2,000 U.S. personnel. Approximately 2,000 British service members were killed on different beaches throughout the Normandy coast, as did an estimated 340 Canadian soldiers. German soldiers suffered between 4,000 and 9,000 casualties, with many buried in the Lacombe German Military Cemetery. Because surviving forces were busy taking positions along the coast, the dead of D-Day were not generally attended to immediately following their deaths. To be sure, a dedicated crew of graves registration soldiers would deal with the problem as soon as possible, but no one expected them to be digging graves while under heavy fire during the beach storm. The best a surviving soldier could do was cover the corpses with a blanket or other fabric and continue his journey. Many recalled the terrifying sight of bodies floating in the ocean and collapsing on the beach, with some areas so densely populated that surviving soldiers had to crawl on top of them. One iconic photograph depicts 2nd Lieutenant Walter Sidlowski kneeling next to a draped body of a fallen comrade on Omaha Beach, with other remains in the background. The image appears to have been captured in the heat of the battle, but the National World War II Museum adds that it was taken a day later, on June 7th. First-hand testimonies from military men who landed on the beach after the first wave describe the terrifying sight of bodies in the surf and dispersed across the sand. Manuel Bromberg, an artist who visited the scene three days after the landing, depicted the continuous burial of soldiers on the beach, which was carried out by German prisoners of war. Though many of the military forces who approached Normandy's beaches on June 6 intended to land and push into Europe, some were anticipated to return to ships waiting farther back in the English Channel. Others remained on those ships to accept returning landing craft, as well as wounded and dead soldiers who were brought back into the boats. Robert E. Davenport was a naval intercept officer aboard the USS Henrico. Davenport said other ship-bound officers watched as smaller transports vanished into the horizon on their route to participate in the Omaha Beach landing. When those boats returned, several landing craft carried the remains of men killed by German artillery before they left the ship. Other personnel were injured or killed because of a sandbar, forcing them to leave early and wade across the waves under heavy fire. Some were then dragged back inside the vessel. Davenport recalled that the smaller boats would open their ramps to discharge water accumulated during landing. The water on the ship occasionally flowed red from spilled blood. Back on the beach, soldiers recounted that bodies were periodically washed back onto the coast, adding to the already staggering quantity of remains that needed to be retrieved and buried in makeshift graves. German soldiers were forced to work as gravediggers. In contrast to later wars, where combat casualties were transported back to the United States for burial in family or national military cemeteries, the Allied dead of the Normandy assault were buried near where they fell. The decomposing dead posed a health concern to the living, thus they needed to be buried as soon as possible and safely. Instead of using Allied forces for this task, the Allies assigned German prisoners of war to lay out cemeteries, dig graves, and bury the combat dead. This allowed Allied soldiers to focus on more important operations elsewhere in the combat zone, while keeping the Germans busy. The cemetery has both German and Allied casualties. Bloody Omaha Omaha Beach was one of five beach landing areas used in the amphibious assault component of Operation Overlord during World War II. The Normandy landings on June 6, 1944 marked the Allies' invasion of German-occupied France. The term Omaha refers to an 8-kilometer stretch of Normandy's coast facing the English Channel, running from east of saint honorine de pert to west of Vierville-sur-Mer, on the right bank of the Douvres River estuary. 
Landings were required to connect the British landings to the east at Gold and the American landings to the west at Utah, resulting in a continuous lodgment on the Normandy coast of the Bay de Seine. Taking Omaha was to be the task of U.S. Army forces, with maritime transport and a naval bombardment force provided mostly by the U.S. Navy and Coast Guard, with support from the British, Canadian, and Free French fleets. The major goal at Omaha was to establish an 8-kilometer deep beachhead between port en bessin and the Via River, connecting with the British landings at Gold to the east and reaching the area of Isigny to the west to hook up with the Zevon Corps landing at Utah. The untested American 29th Infantry Division, accompanied by nine companies of U.S. Army Rangers, redirected from Point du Hoc, launched an assault on the western part of the beach. The eastern part was assigned to the 1st Infantry Division, which had seen combat before. The German 352nd Infantry Division opposed the landings. Of the 12,020 men, 6,800 were seasoned combat forces assigned to defend a 53-kilometer front. The German plan was predicated on defeating any seaborne assault at the water's edge, with defenders mostly placed in coastal strongholds. The Allied strategy planned for early assault waves of tanks, infantry, and battle engineers to weaken coastal fortifications, allowing larger ships to dock in subsequent waves. However, virtually nothing went as planned. Due to navigational difficulties, most landing craft missed their targets throughout the day. The fortifications were shockingly robust, resulting in significant deaths among landing U.S. troops. Under intensive bombardment, the engineers battled to clear the beach obstacles. Later landings congregated around the few passages that had been prepared. Weakened by fatalities sustained during the landing, the surviving assault forces were unable to clear the exits from the beach. This generated additional complications and delays for subsequent landings. Small penetrations were ultimately obtained by parties of survivors, launching improvised assaults, mounting the bluffs between the most heavily fortified sites. By the end of the day, two small, isolated footholds had been secured, which were then exploited against weaker defenders further inland, allowing the original D-Day objectives to be met during the next few days. Dog tag. The word dog tag refers to a specific sort of identifying tag worn by military troops. The tags are mostly used to identify casualties. They contain personal information about the individual, such as identification and basic medical information like blood type and vaccination history. They frequently suggest religious preferences. Dog tags are often made from a corrosion-resistant metal. They frequently contain two copies of the information either in the form of a single tag that may be split in half or two identical tags on the same chain. This intended duplication allows one tag, or half tag, to be collected from a deceased individual for notification, while the duplicate remains with the corpse if the conditions of battle preclude immediate recovery. The term emerged and gained popularity because the tags resembled animal registration tags. A massive repatriation of World War II dead. Since the beginning of the conflict, Men and women who perished overseas have remained where they fell. When the War Department ordered that no American service member who died overseas be returned home, the ships at Pearl Harbor were still on fire. From Algiers to Saipan and Bastogne, the dead would be buried near battlefields or left undiscovered, usually after planes crashed in distant areas, until all fighting had stopped. Ships, aircraft, and ports were not equipped to transfer and store the deceased. The government allocated resources to fighting the war not managing its aftermath. Nonetheless, families expected the government to return their fallen soldiers, as it had after World War I. They wrote letters, called their political leaders, and remained vigilant. In late 1945, an army colonel in charge of managing the dead reported that his office had received 75,000 unsolicited letters from families requesting that the bodies of their sons, brothers, and spouses be brought home. Families knew no bodies would return until the war was over. This had been the government's policy. However, once the combat had ended, they were determined that neither they nor their fallen loved ones would be forgotten. The scale of the battle was unprecedented, and there was little advanced military planning for dealing with the dead. Families wanted to know when they could expect bodies to return home. What forms should be filed? One mother even offered to sell her home to pay for the repatriation of her son's remains. In the fall of 1945, Congress passed legislation to bring home the fallen. However, unlike World War I, when most American casualties were in France, this fight presented a massive logistical difficulty in collecting dead strewn all over Allied and enemy territory on six continents. If an estimated 300,000 bodies were collected and returned, the cost would be $195 million, or nearly $2.6 billion today. Conclusion On May 8, 1945, World War II in Europe ended. 
As the news of Germany's surrender spread around the world, joyful people gathered in the streets, clutching newspapers proclaiming victory in Europe. Later that year, U.S. President Harry S. Truman declared Japan's surrender and the end of World War II. The word immediately spread, and jubilation broke out across the United States. On September 2, 1945, formal surrender documents were signed aboard the USS Missouri, claiming victory over Japan Day. VJ Day was particularly significant. The terrible and arduous war had officially ended, but it was also melancholy for the many Americans whose loved ones would not come home. More than 400,000 Americans devoted their lives to ensure America's independence. Despite the exultation, it was recognized that those who were not present to celebrate best represented the genuine meaning of the day. In our thumbnail, we can see a couple of soldiers examining dead bodies on the ground. The war was terrible, and millions of people perished because of it. I'm a peaceful individual, so seeing how World War II caused millions of deaths over the course of a few years makes me cringe. What about you? Why don't you let us know in the comments below what you think of the war? Well, that's it for now. I hope you enjoyed this video. Please give us a like and let us know in the comments what you think. Check out our other videos and subscribe to be part of the fun. Click on the notification icon so you can see our new videos as soon as they're uploaded. Thank you for watching and see you next time.